Mondo, thanks again for doing this a second time. It's almost like I feel like we're we're in Hollywood. We're, okay, take two, take three, take four. Well, this is take two. So prayerfully, this goes smooth all the way through. Before we get cracking, I, I, <laughs> I know you've seen me do this already. So let me get through this really quick. A couple housekeeping items. If you enjoy the content that you're seeing um, and you feel led to donate to support the ministry, of serpents and doves, by all means, you could do that. If you go to the website, I'll have it listed below. Uh, on the top right-hand side, there is a donate via PayPal button. You can do that that way. Or if you'd like some hard goods, you can go to the shop tab and you can look through there and see what you like. They're good uh, springboards for conversations, good talking points, good conversation starters. So uh, if you go down to the footer as well, um, you can, there's a donate button there and then little hidden gem that I always like to put. I always feature different artists down here, Christian artists. Um, and I like to support their ministry as well. So uh, you get their music down there if you like, but we're not here for this today. We are here for prophecy watchers, Mondo Gonzalez from prophecy watchers. So, um, the first time we kind of went through this, I'm going to go through this rather quickly again. You guys also have a donate tab right there. It's on the top right-hand side. Again, this Prophecy Watchers is chock full of amazing resources. You guys have an e-newsletter. It's right there. People can sign up to get that, right? Yep. Okay, so get the e-newsletter. I uh, highly recommend it. The magazine, I didn't say this last time, and maybe this is good that we're going through this again. The magazine is great. It's fabulous. You guys have... Um, you really have contributors from all over, right? Oh, yeah. We have Pete Garcia. I mean, Bill Salas, L.A. Marjula, you name it. Yeah. Lots of people. So you guys can go there, check it out. There's an annual subscription for it as well. Is it print and both um, digital? Yep. We have print and digital. Yep. Okay. So uh, check that out. Also, there's videos. Um, Gary Stearman is back in the house, which is great. Uh, we talked a bit about this. So tell us a bit um, about the Homeward Bound Conference that already happened the homeward bound conference is, was in may and uh we had 23 speakers that gave tremendous messages i mean it was really awesome all the all the main guys that people would want to hear from and so people can see it they can see every last uh, message they can do it on demand video or they can order the dvds a lot of people like that but great it was a great conference in colorado springs Very truly cool. awesome yeah and I, I told you last time i said oh well last time as if it was days ago it was just a few minutes ago before we crashed that I said, you guys can't do that again because anyone that's anyone in Bible prophecy was there. And if like a big tornado or something hit, then where, where do we go? Right. Who do we listen to? Um, you guys would. Anyways, we'll just leave it at that. Three locations next time. <laughs> um, so there's all this great, great, um, uh, great resources here, books uh, and a lot of online content. So no excuses for really, really good content. And then tell us really quick, um, I'm going to jump back over to us. Tell us quickly about uh, the conference that's going to be coming up. Yeah, we have a conference in um, March in Orlando where we're going to have 15 speakers and kind of do the same thing, kind of give current event updates, uh, Bible teaching, uh, certainly a lot of community like-mindedness. And uh, it's going to be, again, another great time. People love hanging out, sitting around, and people who believe in, in that we're watching the end times unfold. It's just encouraging. Yeah, for sure. yeah. For, and we are watching the end times unfold. Uh, one of the viewers yesterday, it was kind of a bummer. Um, she's written in before, and uh, right after the Hope for Our Times um time that I had, well, with Pastor Tom Hughes, she wrote in and said, you know, I was so discouraged because I went to uh, watch this pastor that I've seen before. And uh, he got into talking about end times. And he said, don't be fooled by these prophecy guys that are telling you the rapture is going to happen soon. You guys are going to be pretty much stuck here. And uh, don't be, you know, don't be duped. And so she said she was down and out. And I thought that was really sad. She watched the um, the YouTube podcast with uh, Pastor Tom and I, and the Lord revived her spirits because she was encouraged again by what we had to say. <clears throat> and I want to make sure that 
that's something on the forefront of everybody's mind is that the Lord is coming back soon. We don't know when we don't have, we're not setting dates when we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but if we look at what's happening around us, uh, we definitely know that the, the tribulation is casting its shadows pretty crisp. And, you know, like they say, when you see the, what is it? The Christmas decorations go up, you know, that Thanksgiving's right around the corner. Yep. And so we know that the Lord is coming for his bride soon. So be encouraged with that. Uh, the, the Lord tells us, and Paul talks about that as well, to make sure that we're encouraged as we see the day approaching as well. You know, that we, we, we're not of the night, we're of the light. And so um, we're not of the darkness. And, and so we need to take, uh, just be encouraged knowing that Christ is coming back soon, mm -hmm. soon. So anyways, with that, I'm going to turn the reins over to you. And I know you rehearsed this already. So tell <laughs> us, tell us a bit about, about yourself, about, you know, uh, how you came to know the Lord and then up to present day prophecy watchers. Well, uh, honestly, I think one of the great things is that, uh, I was not raised a Christian. Um, I became, uh, God called me to himself when I was 18. I was actually in a philosophy of, a philosophy of religion class in college where the teacher was an atheist and he was talking about all the, all the ways in which God is not real. And, it, you know, when you go to sleep at night, God was just kind of, you know, hitting me on the shoulder saying, really think about that logically. And uh, ended up, I was one of those guys that was overnight, uh, became a believer, started reading the Bible, um, started reading about prophecy. Uh, that was in 1993. Did someone and witness then, to you? Uh, you know what? Yeah, my cousin actually came into witness to me and his, his witnessing was you're going to hell. <laughs> And <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to so, do it. <laughs> yep, all this stuff was going on in the background. And then it came that big uh, truth that I was uh, on my way to hell. And uh, so that the scripture really convicted me. And I was like, oh, wow, I don't want to go there. And then through that, you know, you begin to learn about what it means to be a follower of Jesus and, you know, that he expects you to be obedient, not perfection, but obedient. And uh, so I began to do that. I loved learning and I was, I'm just a reader, reader, reader. And finally, my wife was like, you know, you're, you're reading all these books. Why don't you get credit for it? So I was like, well, that's probably true. <laughs> so I started going to college and I went to school at Moody Bible Institute and then moved, moved to Chicago in that area. And as I was pastoring there, as a youth pastor, I finished my bachelor's degree and then also went on to get a master's in archaeology, uh, which was really fun. So I got to learn a lot of the languages and stuff like that. And then we moved from there to Washington State, back near family, which is where we're from, and pastored there for a while and then moved to uh, Lake Tahoe, Nevada. Um, and so then about a year ago is when I came here to Prophecy Watchers. So it's been a, it's been an interesting journey over the last 20 years of how God has allowed me to be in ministry and then now to to teach on prophecy here and to research and write which is just a great privilege that's amazing man you've you've uh, definitely done a lot of pastoring it seems like right kind of jumping around yep. and uh, you said you enjoyed that the pastorate you know i love people and so i really enjoyed uh pastoring people and just being real but also having the opportunity of all the churches that i was at just to teach the scripture and what i found was that uh, people really enjoyed a, a steady diet of the word. Yeah, uh, it took them a little bit of getting used to it, but then oftentimes, you know, they'd be like, "Oh man, we 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 don't we don't just get good Bible teaching anymore," and that's what the church needs. No yeah, doubt. that's for sure. I think there's a big lack of that, especially as we as we you know move into further into the last days. We're we're going to see that kind of change big time as we are seeing that shift. Um, within the church happen where you don't have sound biblical teaching happening, not in every church, but in a, a good portion of the churches, you just don't have that. And then a lot of them ignoring prophecy completely, just yeah. not talking about that whatsoever. And in comes ministries like Prophecy Watchers. And for those that may not know, um, Gary, uh, Gary Stearman, he was on Prophecy in the News. Which I used to watch with J.R. Church. And um, then uh, when he left um, Prophecy in the News, he started uh, Prophecy Watchers quite a few years back. Do you about what time was that? That was in the fall of 2014. OK. And I remember that um, Bob and Gary were in. I don't know mm -hmm. whose living room that was. I think that was Gary's living room. OK. And I remember they had one camera. It was a little yep. Canon camera. 
and you know they hooked their mics up to it and and that's how they started prophecy watchers i think it is so so cool to see how the lord provided and how the lord grew the ministry to where it's at today which is amazing and i didn't doubt that gary is um a powerhouse when it comes to bible prophecy and history i think is he a history major um you know he's actually like a, he does a lot of things but i think he was a psychology major but okay some things that people don't know is he actually wrote the technical manuals for uh, the Cessna aircraft. Wow. <laughs> so he's he's got a very brilliant mind. Yeah, he does. And he flies. Well, I don't know if he still flies, but he used to pilot, didn't he? Yep, he did. He And he actually is just right now uh, getting rid of his plane. I mean, he, he's 84, but he's a young 84 in that yeah. sense. And, uh, he's like, yeah, it's time to me to retire the plane. Yeah. So he always had a little model. I don't know. Is it back there somewhere? Probably not. Uh -huh. But he, he had a little model of his. Is that his plane? I, I don't know that that was like a, it's over in the other studio, okay. but it, that's a double uh, biplane, but I think his is a single Cessna plane. Okay. I mean, I, I always thought that was impressive. And there's a little clip of him. Is that him in the intro you guys play um, on, yeah. the, on the plane, yep. right? Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. Flying one of those. So if you guys uh, are watching the intro to Prophecy Watchers, when you see Gary, that's Gary on the plane. That's actually mm -hmm. him. So I think that's pretty neat. Uh, I'm so glad that you're there. You know your stuff. I'll tell you that much. Um, I know I have a 10. I send these outlines, but as if you don't need these, it's just more to keep me on track. But we're going to be talking about the Battle of Armageddon. I said the battle, but we're going to actually it's 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 better said the campaign of Armageddon. And so since I said that, why don't we do what a great intro. Let's just talk <laughs> about that. Talk about the difference between some that call it the Battle of Armageddon and some that say the campaign, which one is actually proper you know i think that uh even in prophecy you have a lot of traditions that come to play um and i, I like to sometimes uh, challenge those traditions in the sense of whether they're biblical and not that not that uh people who you know have each side or where there's godly people on every side i like peace and harmony amongst the discussion but uh it's not just a single battle it, it definitely is a campaign that involves several different battles times and locations that lead up to what people typically consider Jesus's final second coming out of the sky. But a lot of people don't realize that, uh, that you have in Zechariah 14, where it talks about uh, the Messiah and God putting his foot on the mountain, that he actually appears in, in, in other places prior to that on his way to, to the, uh, the Mount of Olives. Yeah. And, and we're going to, we're going to definitely talk about that because so we hear a lot of talk about Armageddon. That's from uh, it's in the Jezreel Valley. It's really Harm uh, Harm Megiddo. Is that right? And that's uh, the valley. That's also the valley. I had a picture of it here. It's a massive, well, massive valley. You know, I'll, I'll say something on that because um, there late lately there's been some research and people will argue both ways. Of course they do, but a lot of people there's some a lot of the Old Testament scholars are recognizing or at least they're stating that. They don't think that uh, Armageddon, as we find in Revelation 16, actually refers to Megiddo at all. Okay. That it's referring down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which appears in Joel chapter 2. Right. But nevertheless, I mean, it, I, it's fun to read the different things. Michael Heiser wrote a, a chapter on this in his book, Unseen Realm, talking about how, um, you know, Armageddon, Armageddon means mountain of Megiddo, but there's no mountain there. It's, it's a tell. So he makes the claim that, um, it's not there, but either way, there's no doubt that the Valley of Jezreel, which, uh, Tel Megiddo overlooks yeah. is a huge, huge area. And, um, but I, I tend to lean towards the fact that, uh, it's speaking about the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Is that uh, closer down... to Jerusalem, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it really is. Yep. So, um, here's one thing that I, I, now that you said that about, uh, the Valley of, uh, Megiddo is what I found interesting is, and I know Dr. Fruchtenbaum talks about this as well, um, and I'll probably quote him a little later on, but it's a staging place, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is such a massive valley that it could really hold all these armies there ready for battle. But what I found to be um, awkward would be, okay, let's stage everybody up north, and then everybody's got to you know, funnel down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, or, and I want to talk about, um, it's my my understanding from what I read that the Lord doesn't come straight to the Mount of Olives, but that he comes to Basra in Edom, ancient Edom, right? Well, it was in, it's in Jordan to mm -hmm. present day. And that's really where 
uh, the battle begins. Now, I've also heard that he'll come to Jerusalem, battle there, go to Edom, battle there, and then come back up. Um, and that round trip is about, you know, a couple hundred miles, which is 1,600 furlongs now. Maybe let's address that a bit because, okay, let's say they're staged at our um, Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo, up in Jezreel Valley. Mm -hmm. For them to actually come back down, that's that's quite a way to hike down, you know, um, for your armies. You're not mm -hmm. flying them over there. I would imagine there's there's a lot of fatigue going on, too. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of demonic activity, mm -hmm. hands down, period. But my, from my understanding, and I'd like to hear your take on it, I understand that the Lord comes to Basra. Let's address that first, because it would make sense that if the Lord is, not is, the Lord is supernaturally protecting the remnant Jews, the nation, down in Petra. I know there's arguments that it could be, uh, it's not Petra, but uh, another city. I don't, and you're the archaeologist. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe it to be Petra. Um, and so he comes down there because, like we said, the Antichrist is waging war. One of the main uh, pushes of Armageddon is to annihilate whatever Jewish remnant is there. So talk a bit about that. Yeah, I, there's there's several scriptures that come to mind. And the first one is is Revelation chapter 12, where the woman uh, who is Israel in that chapter flees because the, the dragon has been cast out of heaven. He comes down to empower his uh, Antichrist figure, as we see in Revelation 13. But in Revelation 12, it tells us very specifically that the woman uh, was being pursued by the dragon uh, who, who set out a flood to get her. And God brings to earth to protect her. And she flees where? It says she flees into the wilderness for time, time and half a time where she's protected. So what we see in the chronology is that it happens in the middle of the tribulation. There's a lot of things happening there. The Antichrist declares himself to be God in 2 Thessalonians 2. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15, there's the abomination of desolation. And even there, he talks about fleeing into the mountains. Right. And so you have a consistency all through the scripture. Well, the question that people wonder is, well, where are they fleeing to? Well, they're fleeing into the wilderness. They're fleeing into the mountains. Well, interestingly, in Daniel 11, 41, you have... The, this it's it's a very interesting passage talking about a future campaign of the Antichrist, and there it's describing that um, uh, Ammon, Moab, and Edom escape the hand of the Antichrist, which just happens to be the country of Jordan, right. which is where Petra is. And so, if you take that scripture, you begin to say, well, why would God prevent the Antichrist to having authority over that area? Well, if it's if it comes to be so, it's because they flood there, and yeah. so. When you come to Isaiah 63, which is a picture of uh, the Messiah coming to uh, wage war, it says, who is this who comes from Basra? Basra and so right. it's interesting that when you look at those passages as well, uh, another passage that comes to play is in Micah 2.12, which is describing the, the refuge as being like a sheepfold. Well, when you go to Petra, everybody understands if you go through the Seek, it's, it's like a sheepfold that opens up. And so it's very narrow and it would be hard to, to bring tanks or anything in there without having some sort of defense. So you have some consistency there between all the passage of Petra or Basra, this area in Jordan being one of the places of refuge for uh, Israel fleeing. Yeah. And Basra means sheepfold, right? Mm -hmm. Or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, it would fit perfectly. And, and again, I don't know exactly where the passage is in the Old Testament, but it talks about also, it has to meet, I guess, certain requirements where the Jews are going to flee. One of them is the wilderness. Um, rocks, I guess, is yeah. another uh, uh, requirement. I think there's a couple others I don't know off the top of my head. And really, the only one that fits those is down in Petra, right, um, yep. which is not too far. How far is Basra, Petra? What are we looking at? Maybe 100 miles from. So not from too far. Here. No. So it would it would make sense. See, the way I see it is it would make sense that the Lord comes first to protect that remnant and fight there. So the battle starts there, from my understanding, because um, the Lord's the Lord's raiment is dipped in crimson, right, in blood. And it's it's from all the 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 fighting that he's doing. So like Lee believes that we are going to be doing some sort of of fighting battle. I don't know if if. I necessarily uh, agree with that, 
I haven't really done enough like Lee does. You know, Lee is Lee Brainerd is an amazing mind. And so, but he thinks that we're going to partake in some of the battles. But from my understanding, it's the Lord alone that's going to be doing the battle. What is your take on that? Well, I, I think if you read Isaiah 63, where that that imagery comes, you know, who is this who comes yeah. from Basra? And and he says there, I alone. He actually says that I alone am, am treading the wine press of God. And so his robe is covered in blood. And it's not his the robe dipped in blood that you see in Revelation 19 as it comes to people tend to think, oh, that was his his crucifixion. No, Revelation 19 is his robe is dipped in the blood of his enemies. Yeah. Again, which is consistent with Isaiah 63. So I think that we we are coming with him, but the Lord doesn't need our help. And I don't think it's his his goal to have his bride participate in this. I mean, he does it We in second Thessalonians chapter two, he destroys the antichrist with the breath of his mouth. And yeah. so I think God just says enough, but we're following him. And I, the imagery is, his is his robe uh, literally dipped in blood? Uh, not necessarily. I don't think that's has to be the case, but we know that it's victory over his enemies and uh, they will be annihilated, no doubt, because Israel is there. People forget that. Well, why would Israel flee? Well, one of the purposes of the tribulation is to refine them. Zechariah 13, it says yeah. one third will come through the fire. And Matthew 23, 37 through 39 speaks about, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the purpose of the tribulation is to humble Israel to the point of apologizing and confessing their sin of rejecting Jesus as their Messiah, and then asking him to come back. So when they're there, the whole point of the squeezing, the refining is when they get to that place and they flee to Petra or somewhere out there yeah. that they're getting squeezed out. And this is it. I mean, when the Antichrist f goes after Israel, the dragon, he's going out for genocidal purposes. Sure. And so there's such a consistency in looking at all the various passages of scripture from a futurist perspective. Yeah. Um, one thing that I want to maybe solidify is the fact that the Lord, some people think that when the Lord comes back, the second coming, boom, tribulation is over. And that's not the case yet. Correct. Um, because when the Lord comes back uh, again, as, as we believe to Basra um, sets his foot on terra firma, that does not end the tribulation. We are now what in the sixth bowl judgment. Is that right? Well, I, I would, I would tend to see that the, when, when he comes to Basra um, and, and maybe there's a few days in there, I think it is towards the end yeah. where, yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking maybe the last week of the seven year tribulation right. he comes to Basra, grabs them, rescues them. Then he's heading to the, the campaign at Jerusalem yep. and the Mount of Olives where he's going to finish it off there. But yeah, I wouldn't say that it's really long by yeah. any means, but it's still. So again, I want to clarify what we're saying is, I think for a lot of years, there was this un this misunderstanding that the Lord's second coming was straight to the Mount of Olives. Oh, yeah. and, and that's what ended the tribulation. And that's what started the Messianic kingdom. And that's really fuzzy right there. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we clarify that. Now, um, let's back up a few years, because on take one, we talked about this again to clarify where at what point antichrist takes complete power so yeah. we mentioned uh the three and a half year mark let's just back up just a little bit i don't know if we're looking at a week if we're looking at months i'm not sure but tell us about what happens with the 10 kings down to seven kings and the antichrist so what, what you have is um and i i i I'm one that does not believe that the seals are opened yet. I think that they're clearly in the future. Uh, Revelation 6, 1, uh, Jesus is the one. He's the lamb. He's opening the seals. It's the wrath of God starting at the first seal because it's a supernatural. Um, it's a supernatural engagement where Jesus is calling forth the, the one of the living creatures to open each of the seals. Yeah. So clearly this is the wrath of God starting at at. at the first seal. A lot of people disagree. Godly people. That's fine. So wait, I don't wait. See <clears throat> so you say. You you're saying that the seals open where at what point? You the beginning, at the, right? At the beginning, oh, okay, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, I want to. Some make... people, so, some people right now are, are think that the, the seals were opened when Jesus left, or we might even see the seals. Oh no um, way! Uh, that's what I don't I don't see it no either way. because 
I wrote an article uh, recently that people can find it on our website talking about does the rapture or does the tribulation begin after the sixth seal? And I show eight reasons why that can't be so and, and everything else. But going back to the main topic is most scholars, I think that they're right, is the first person that comes riding uh, is riding on the white horse, which is this figure that is does has a bow but no arrows. And so and he comes to conquer and to conquer. And then we see in the second, uh, the red horse that appears, he comes to take peace from there. So I do see the Antichrist arriving on the scene um, right at the beginning. Now, yeah. what he's doing there, he goes to conquer and to conquer, and he's he's being unveiled. He's being revealed to the world. He comes speaking blasphemy and great words from what other passages say, especially in the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. But he's he's consolidating his power very loosely in the beginning of the tribulation. And then war happens. And in the midst of this chaos, he begins to closer, 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 kind of bringing it in along with the the, the, the woman, right? We know yeah. the woman is participating in this whole thing. And then you have the, the other kings that are there working with him and he deposes three of them. But when, when you, we come to the midpoint is where you have this uh, confrontation where he gets killed, he is resurrected. And the dragon gives him unlimited authority. And we see in Revelation 13, it appears in Daniel 7 as well, that he's given the authority to continue for 42 months. So this is a decree of heaven. Yeah. I mean, we, we can wonder why, but God says, no, I'm going to allow the dragon and his satanic trinity with the, with the false prophet and the Antichrist to rule for 42 months. And that's why in the book of Daniel, it says that the Antichrist figure is given authority to prevail over the saints. These are the tribulation saints. Sure. These are the believers who get saved after the rapture. And so we're coming to this midpoint where there's a lot of things happening, where once that midpoint happens, he declares himself to be God. And then he, after his assassination and revival, unlimited authority for 42 months. Yeah. And they, and they all pledge their allegiance, at least the seven Kings and everybody pledges their allegiance. Yeah. So it's at that point, and I want to make a distinction here. It's at that point in the middle too, where the mark of the beast is enforced and implemented by the false prophet. Uh, Cause I, I know there's a lot of folks out there that, and I've read articles and I've, I've heard people say, well, uh, you know what? It's, <laughs> Uh, this this chip coming out is is the mark of the beast or don't use this credit card or don't do this or this could be the mark of the beast and i that that's not the case now those might be technologies that may be used we don't really know and i'm not going to get into that because at the end of the day i'll probably get censored on youtube if i really get into that subject right now but um one thing that we know for sure is complete and unmitigated power at the three and a half year mark goes into the temple, says, I'm God. You guys need to all worship me. A lot of people do. Um, one of the things that gives him that clout, I guess, would be what you just mentioned is that counterfeit resurrection. And I think it's really important for people to understand that it, I don't think that if it wasn't for that counterfeit resurrection, he wouldn't be able to dupe as many people as he's going to, because they're going to go, whoa, who's like this guy? Who can, like the Bible says, who can make war? against this man and so it's right before the three and a half year mark there is a battle that happens those that uh, there's three kings of the ten that make battle against the antichrist and it's at that point probably that he's killed like you said and then the counterfeit resurrection happens and that's where he's like now it's all me it's all me and so they take total authority over what's going to happen for the next three and a half years now Make a distinction also between the 200 million man um, army from Revelation chapter 9, I believe, and then those kings of the east, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, when it comes to the 200 million number that you find in Revelation 9, there's different perspectives. I think some of the traditional perspectives has always been that uh, looking at, I would say, going back to the 80s or earlier that that was China because China right. claimed to have a 200 million man army. I, I don't see it that way. I yeah. mean, I could be wrong, but I see it clearly as being demonic. If when you look at the description of revelation nine, they're, they're coming out of the earth and it's, it's a demonic horde, especially because it gives some of the descriptions of how they are. Um, so I don't think it's a, not, not that I don't take this, the scripture literally when necessary, but I don't think it's talking about humans, but the Kings of the East 
you do see that in Revelation 16, where these three frog, demon-like frog things uh, are released in order to gather the armies together, because there, there's so many things that God is doing in the in the book of Revelation or in the time of the tribulation. Again, his goal is Israel, and there's evangelism going on, but his goal is to squeeze Israel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Yep. And so he allows um, the, the Antichrist to have and gives him authority to, for that 42 months, but it's not without confrontation. So he has to subdue people and he does it through war. That's yeah. why, as you mentioned, in Revelation 13, who can make war like him? People are enamored by him. But at the end of the day, God brings the other nations to Jerusalem for two reasons. One, in order to uh, force the Antichrist's hand. But secondly, it's gathering all the nations so that when we when you come to the end, this is like Psalm 2, per, completely out of Psalm 2, yeah. where the nations are there to fight the Antichrist, and then they see Jesus coming, and then they all turn on him. <laughs> so you're like, so God gathers them, God allows this uh, to happen, to gather them there anyway, because after Jesus returns, there's going to be the um, the sheep and goat judgment and, and the nations, sure. it says, gather all the nations. So you have this consistency. It's it's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to quote uh, kind of going back to uh, – what happens at Basra? Because um, there's a little debate. Now, when I say debate, it's very loose. It's not like anybody's very dogmatic about this. And when we talk about these things, it's important that there are certain parts that we can't be dogmatic about, right? Because we just Agreed, don't yeah. know 100 percent um we know 100 percent what scripture says but i think when we kind of move outside of that realm it starts to become a little speculative right uh, we believe it's petra maybe it's not exactly that area we don't know maybe it might be somewhere a little you know farther out i don't know there's there's things that we just again can't be dogmatic about but for example when talking about the bloodletting what's going to happen the 1600 long furlongs Dr. Frutenbaum um, has an interesting take on this. So from Jeremiah 49, chapter 49, verse 20 to 22, he says this. In the context of Joel chapter 3, verses 9 to 14, this passage is dealing with a campaign of Armageddon. The massive bloodletting that begins at Basra begins moving south down to the Arabah until it empties in the Red Sea at the present day cities of Isla and Aqaba. The distance from there to Jerusalem is about 200 miles. The level of blood is to be about four feet high. That's huge. Exactly how this will be fulfilled remains to be seen. It may not be totally human blood, but also things turned into blood by divine judgment. The battle will come to an end in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, ending the campaign of Armageddon. So my question to you is, what do you think of Dr. Frutenbaum's interpretation when it comes to that? Um, well, I would say that 99% of the time, I absolutely appreciate what he says. And I think that he, um, this is in his book, footsteps of the Messiah, yep, which I yep. have. And, yep. uh, you know, one of the things that he, he's, he's, what I appreciate about him is he tries to keep the scripture literal. Yes. Uh, he, but he also says that, you know, I think one of the things he said, there's kind of a caveat in that how it is fulfilled is, is going to be, it remains to be seen. Seems. Because what what we what you do have in the book of Revelation, and you said it earlier, that there's no doubt the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. It has symbols in it. These symbols point to real things. So it's not we just throw it out as this great sure. thing of symbolism. But it's interesting that the book of Revelation has a lot of consistencies, not only with the book of Daniel, but with other apocalyptic literature of the first century. Um, this phraseology of, of blood up to the bridal appears in a couple other places it appears in the book of enoch you know chapter 100 as well as in a book called fourth ezra's and so when you have there that is can be very apocalyptic for sure and the imagery is pointing to 100 percent thorough victory so the fact that there's a connection there with some of the other literature um I can look at it and say i don't need it to be literal i mean if god wants to make it literal i'm certainly open to correction but we don't have to dismiss it because it does have a sense of complete 100% victory. Is that what the writer's showing? Possibly. Yeah. And it would be consistent with the genre. Um, is it literal? I would agree with Fruchtenbaum. If it's literal, how that is fulfilled remains to be seen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, 
my mind can't really fathom that, you know, mm -hmm. blood all the way to the horse's bridles. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Four feet deep. Uh, if anybody, I'm sure there's a lot of people that swim, they might do lap swimming. Uh, our son swims a lot. So we spend a lot of time in the pool too. Go get in a pool and go to the four foot mark and see where the, the water reaches up to you. That's pretty insane. And for that to stretch 200 miles, uh, yeah, like Dr. Frutenbaum says, I don't know. We won't yeah. be here, to be honest nope. with you. So uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. We 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 might be watching yeah. as we're coming down. That's correct? right. That's right. But I'm sure I'm sure we won't be like, hey, Mondo, yeah. this is it right here. <laughs> you know, this is how it's happening. Uh, um, but at the end of the day, I think the picture everybody gets is that it's going to be very, very, very devastating. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, we have all the devastation that's happened throughout the tribulation. Um, we've got the, the seal judgments, we've got the trumpet judgments. And like we just mentioned, we're, you know, uh, tying up the bowl judgments too. So I think it's just going to be chaos. It's going to be nasty looking. I, I was telling you right before we got on about this and Pete Garcia, I have to give credit to Pete. This isn't something that I found on my own. Pete found this website called mid journey. It's through discord. And it's an artificial intelligence that creates artistic renderings based on the input that you give it. Mm -hmm. And some of these look straight up real. It depends how much you refine the image. It depends how much detail you put into it. But I'm going to show you guys. I just put literally Battle of Armageddon. That is all I put. This is the second refinement of this artificial intelligence. And uh, let me see if it was this one right here. There you go. There's the image. Now, mind you, folks, that this is an artistic rendering of an artificial intelligent algorithm. And this is only take two. I only refined this twice. Um, I could probably get this down to an extremely detailed image. I just didn't want to spend the time to do that. But I don't think our minds can quite conceive the devastation that's going to ensue from the beginning of the tribulation. I'll, I'll even say this much from the day after the rapture all the way to the end of the tribulation. Uh, we can't wrap our minds around that now. Needless to say, it's going to be horrific. Um, but uh, thank God we're not going to be here and nobody has to be here either. But before we close, um, one thing that I want to tie in as we finish this talk about Armageddon is Christ is in Basra. Jesus is in Basra. He's battling his way up to Jerusalem. What happens when he gets to Jerusalem? So we see uh, Paul kind of give a summary of that in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So here... Let's remember Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the, the, all the lights in the universe yeah. go dark. Yep. So Jesus comes and what does he do? He's, he's coming there to, to rescue the Jews because they asked him to come back. They called, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Matthew 23, 37 through 39. It's a great passage. Um, so Jesus is coming back. He comes to the Mount of Olives. And he, as he's coming there, there's, again, Psalm 2, this war that's happening where they are seeking to re, re, try to remove the bonds that God has because Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. Yep. So the nations rebel. So as he's coming there, the Antichrist is there. Jesus wipes him out with the breath of his mouth. It's over and done. He comes to the Mount of Olives with his, with his army, which would be us as, as well as the other heavenly host. But he also sends the angels out, it says in Matthew 24, to gather the elect, the tribulation believers at the time, all from around the world. He gathers them because he, his, his goal is to bring everybody to Jerusalem. Why? Because we know in the book of Joel, as well as, well as Matthew 25, that all the nations are going to be gathered there to be judged before Jesus inaugurates the, the millennial kingdom. Right. So he, Jesus is certainly gathering there and the nations have gathered as well for war but as as he comes he he again it's i think that even though it is a campaign when jesus shows up it doesn't need to be drawn out sure but the the campaign the campaign is based on different locations not necessarily because oh man we're losing the battle we got to put our arms up like moses yeah. you know <laughs> yeah. jesus is unlimited yep with the breath of his mouth done 
slaughtered, annihilated. Yeah. And then and then he comes to judge. And then he he does address the Antichrist because we know in Revelation 19 that the, the Antichrist and the false prophet are captured. It yes. says that exact words. And they're cast directly into the lake of fire. Yeah. So they're 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 not uh they don't escape, they don't get to hide anywhere. Nope. But aren't one of the so one of the first casualties of the uh campaign of Armageddon, doesn't the Lord kill? the antichrist i mean he dies literally yeah i think well yes because because then he has to be resurrected right so here's something that i find interesting kind of talk about this a bit so when christ rose from the dead he is considered the first fruits of the resurrection correct Mm -hmm. so interesting that the counterfeit son this would be the antichrist is going to be the first fruits of the second resurrection right this and he's gonna go him and the false prophet will be the only ones populating the lake of fire for the millennial reign of christ right the messianic kingdom so um did i get that right yeah i would say that the first fruits is going to be the church that's going to be raptured prior to you know that'll be the first fruits of the resurrection and then but as you mentioned it is interesting that the Antichrist uh, is assumingly raised from the dead. A yeah. lot of people, you know, some scholars fight about it. They don't think it was a real resurrection. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. But what it says in in Revelation is that they are captured alive. Yeah. So so the, alive, they go into the lake of fire, wherever that is, in the outer darkness somewhere. But yes, they, they live there for the thousand years because after Satan is captured, and is at the end of the millennium, it says they throw him into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. Yeah. So you want to talk about some consistency. There's some conscious, alive, living torment for them. Yeah, that's. Um, and again, the Lord didn't create that for humans. It was created for the fallen angels and for Satan himself. And people will say, well, how can a loving God send somebody to hell? And that's not the case. God never sends anybody to hell. First of all, wasn't even created for people. Unfortunately, the fall of man, and that's a whole nother subject. But God never sends somebody to hell. God's given us and gives many people opportunities throughout their lifetime in order to accept the free gift of God and the sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross. He took your place. He took my place so that we wouldn't have to go to that. But people reject it because they want to live their life according to the way they want to live their life, according to their standards and not according to God's standards. And that's not the way it rolls. That's not the way he rolls either. So, okay, we've covered a lot. Um, I I think we can keep going on and on and on because there's there's a lot in the book of Zechariah. There's, uh, there's um, a lot in the book of Joel in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Jeremiah, that we can really continue on, but we won't. But to kind of recap everything, the campaign of Armageddon doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be in Megiddo, the Valley of Jezreel. Could be a staging place. Mm -hmm. Um, Starts in Basra, goes to Jerusalem, ends at Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. And then... So the nations are gathered there because, and I want to make this clear, the Antichrist has his reasons to wage war against God and the remnant Jews, the Jewish nation, to annihilate them, correct? Mm -hmm. And what are the reasons for the nations of the world? They want to destroy the Antichrist. Is that it? Yeah, I think that because in the book of Daniel, it describes that the 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 king of the north is troubles him. He hears troubling news. And then, of course, as you mentioned, Revelation 16, that the Euphrates is dried up yeah. to make way for the, the kings of the east. So even though he has the majority of authority all throughout the world, you, he's still going to have these people. And again, when the when the frog, the demonic frogs are released, it says very clearly that this is part of God's sovereignty because he's going to accomplish his will to gather all the nations there. And they're going to come to fight each other. But then it it helps it helps bring them all together for when the Lord does return. Uh, they they again they all of a sudden you know the enemy of my enemy is my friend sure. and so in that sense they turn on Jesus and go well we don't like that guy but we certainly don't want Jesus and so it's interesting because when you think about the kings of the East as it relates to possibly China or others 
you know, we are dealing with atheistic people who have no desire to have anybody rule and reign over them. Yeah, no, they don't. Not at all. Absolutely. And we can see that now. I mean, there's a lot of power hungry people. We can see the formation. So this new world, this new world order, this is my, this is my interpretation. I think that's going to morph into the 10 Kings. Um, you're not going to have this one world right off the bat. You know, I, there's always going to be people vying for power. No, I've got more than you. No, I'm going to take it from you. And so a one world order right now, right off the bat won't work. Cause I think there's too many power hungry people out there mm -hmm. and the antichrist isn't going to take full control of power consolidated everything until the three and a half year mark. So from my understanding, the way I see things, especially as they're rolling out now is that you have a one, this push for a new world order and you haven't heard much about it lately. So just because you haven't heard much about it doesn't mean that things aren't happening behind the scenes. I said that um, with Pastor Tom Hughes as well. They're wanting you to see what's going on with his hand, but with the other hand, they're working stuff behind the scenes. So, but I don't think that this new world order that they're touting is going to be what's going to go into the, the first three and a half years of the tribulation because we know that it's going to be a 10 king rule right? 10 kingdom rule as well. So it'll be interesting to see in the next, you know, a uh, few months, years, I don't know how long we'll be here to see how this all plays out. I'm praying we're not here too much longer <laughs> Agreed. because things are going to get really, really ugly. And they are, I mean, we can look around the world and we can already, I keep saying this over and over. I want people to get this in their minds is the fact that the tribulation, the four horsemen, they are casting their crisp crisp shadows right now as we speak and so what does that tell us i'll let you know right now that means that if you don't know jesus christ as your lord and savior uh we urge you to surrender your life to jesus christ and i think this would be a perfect segue into that because i don't ever want any one of these podcasts to end without sharing the gospel the good news of jesus christ there's a lot of bad stuff that's going to be happening. A lot of bad stuff that's starting to happen now, right? We we do hear wars and rumors or threats of wars. Famines and pestilences, boy, with all these food shortages, I think it's all man-made. It's all man-created. It doesn't matter how you spin it. It's going to happen. And it's only going to get worse. Uh, you know, you have death. You've got pestilences. You've got diseases. You've got natural disasters happening all around the world, whether they are man-made or not, they're happening. And so these things are going to get progressively worse and worse and worse. So Mondo, do me a favor. And you were a pastor, so this is right up your alley. For those that aren't in Christ, tell them what awaits them. And for those that are in Christ, we know that it's a glorious future. But there's probably a lot of people out there that, don't have hope. They don't know Jesus. What awaits them? But what's the solution? You know, uh, one of the things I used to always teach, and it makes it pretty simple, is I, I, I talk about the four S's. Uh, and the first S is in order to understand the good news of the gospel, we have to understand the bad news. And the first S is that we've all sinned, right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so uh, my question to anybody is, are you perfect? None of us are perfect. And you, and the question is, what are you saying? Well, you have to be perfect to go to heaven. Well, then nobody qualifies exactly right. Nobody qualifies. And so we're all sinners and this, our sin separates us from God. That's Isaiah 59 verse two, the, the wages of sin is death. And so Romans 6, 23, you have these passages that tell us that without Christ, uh, John three thirty six, the wrath of God abides on our head. So that's the bad news is that all of us have fallen short, but the good news 100% is, is, is Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, God demonstrates his love, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the good news is, hey, everybody, there's this, there's this penalty of condemnation. Jesus said in John 3, 18, the world is already condemned. It's in a state of condemnation. He didn't need to even condemn it because it was already there. But the good news is that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And so, you know, I have, again, family and friends that, that don't know him yet. But, you know, again, that John 3, 36, the one who has the son has life. Amen. But he who doesn't have the son shall not see life. So if if you are at that place where you uh, haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus, this is the only way. I mean, and, and pride gets in the way. I don't need anybody. But yeah. you know what? God is holy. So we need to 
humbly come and say, Lord, I know that you didn't need to even give me one way, but you did. And I'm going to accept it and I'm going to follow you and I'm going to repent of my sins and trust in you for salvation. And if you've done that as a believer, man, it is great comfort. Romans 8, 1, there's now no condemnation for anybody in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that puts me to bed at night in comfort of my soul, knowing that Jesus paid it all, right? It is finished. And so to me, that's what it comes down to is, is as the rapture comes and Jesus talks about the rapture and, and, the, and the rescue that's going to happen is that our goal, especially at Prophecy Watchers, is we want to take as many people with us yeah. in the rapture Amen. because people go, well, I'll get saved afterwards. Well, that's true. There's a possibility that you could. But the only way really out of the post-rapture scenario is martyrdom. Yeah. And so I wouldn't recommend that for anybody. And uh, the chances of survival, Revelation 13, 7, very slim. Yeah. God gives the Antichrist authority to, to overcome the saints in the tribulation period. So now is the time uh, to get out ahead and again, to follow Jesus. And you know what? When I first got saved, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my cousin said, well, you're going to hell. And that, that put fear in me. Yeah. But you know what? As I've gotten to know the Lord, I don't serve him out of fear. I serve him out of love yeah. now. Because just realizing how much he's done for me and how much he's forgiven me, I mean, I'm just like, Lord, whatever you'd like, I'm in. Yeah, amen. And so for those that might want to surrender their life to Jesus Christ, why don't you pray for us, if you don't mind? We'll close yeah, this absolutely. way. Go for it. Yep. Father in heaven, for those that are that are listening or watching, and I just pray that you touch their hearts, that they know, that they would know that um, that they're not perfect, that they, they've all done things wrong. We all have but that, that they could call out to you in humility and just simply say, Lord, forgive me for the things that I've done. And I want to serve you. I want to follow you. I, I, I want to have a new heart and a new change and be a new creation in Christ. And so I just ask, Lord, that you would, would grant that to them, that you would hear their prayer, and that they would continue to follow you for the rest of their days. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That was great. We had a, a big hiccup in the beginning, but we finally got through it. And I know um, we kind of jumped from beginning to end into beginning a little bit in between, um, uh, Mondo, thanks so much for, for being on. I really appreciate it. Really, really do. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for everybody watching. Hope you guys were blessed. I hope you guys were encouraged, but I hope you guys were also challenged. I say this all the time to get into the word of God and get the word of God into you. So until the next time, be blessed and remember to keep looking up because our redemption is very, very near. Be encouraged. God bless. Hey, everybody. One thing I forgot to mention uh, during the podcast, and that's why I'm putting it on the end right after I am tagging along the gospel cards. I don't want to let a podcast go by without mentioning these. These are business card size gospel cards that have the word of God, the gospel on it. Um, and if anybody wants these, uh, I will send you 25 cards at no cost. Um, so that if you're at a restaurant or at a coffee shop or you want to pass these out, they're the perfect size. You can even leave them on a table. Um, you can hand them out to anybody. And they're a great way of witnessing. And who knows, somebody might come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because of the message that's on here. And it's not me. This message is what Christ did on the cross for us. And uh, it's something everybody needs to hear. It is the, the message of hope. It is the message of redemption, salvation. And because of what Christ did on the cross, we are justified. And what does that mean? Just as if we'd never sinned. So if you guys want these, I will send you 25 cards out at no cost. Now, if you want more than 25, I would love to send them out. would thrill me to send more than 25 out to you. The only thing I would ask is that you would prayerfully consider leaving a donation to help cover the cost of shipping, the cost of printing. And so that would be the only thing I would ask that you would prayerfully consider. So if that's something you're interested in, Go ahead and uh, you can submit a contact form via the Serpents and Doves website. I'll get that and I will send them out to you. All right. God bless you guys. Take care.